Ooh, hi, everybody. Good evening. Hello. Hi. Well, my name is Kim. I'm director of operations here at the Wayne Theater. And uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome on behalf of the board and the staff and all of us, all of us, all of us, we just, and our ambassadors, amazing ambassadors, we appreciate you being here tonight and thank you so much. Before we get started and I turn things over to Tom, I just wanted to tell you a couple things that are coming up at the Wayne Theater. We have this teeny weeny little chili festival happening. Not teeny weeny. Um, it's, a, it's a happening Saturday. So it's the 13th semi-annual Virginia Chili Blues and Brews uh, Festival. So if anybody's interested, it's from 12 to 9, right at the Lumos Plaza. And uh, we're going to have some fabulous bands. We've got five bands coming. We've got food trucks, tons of exhibitors, vendors, uh, and of course, chili cookers. Yay! So uh, it's going to be really fun. The voting for the, for the general public begins at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So you run around tasting all that great chili. And all the ballots need to be turned in by 6 p.m. And we have awards happening at 7. So that's going to be a really great and fun time. And the weather is going to be beautiful. So please join us if you can. Um, also, on October 3rd, we have a history talk coming up. It's all the Virginia presidents that this gal is gonna be talking about. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. That's a Tuesday night as well. So, you know, check out our website, waynetheater.org, for all the other exciting things that are coming up. And we really appreciate you being here. And uh, Tom Densing, it's all you. Thanks, Kim, and welcome to the Wayne Theater. We're starting our new series of science speakers and we're very excited about the group that we're going to have in front of us for the next several months. We do this from September through April, um, and it's sponsored by several organizations. The Wayne Theater course being a very important part of it, and this is a pay what you will, so I encourage you, if you did not get an opportunity to donate on the way in, if you could do that on the way out, this helps to keep the Wayne Theater going, a very important institution here in, in Waynesboro. I um, also want to welcome our online viewers. We're live streaming tonight on Facebook and uh, on YouTube. And we have all of our previous talks, at least for the last three years, um, recorded in, in a library if you're interested in following up on those. And to the students that are in the audience tonight, welcome. I hope you got the opportunity to take advantage of the free popcorn that we offer to encourage you to show up. I'm Tom Benzing, and I've been emceeing this for about six years, I think. This is our seventh year. I serve on the board for the Center for Cold Waters Restoration, which is a local community group. And I also serve as a trustee on the board of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. And if you've been coming to these talks before, you know that um, we're encouraging or proposing and, and advocating for a campus of the Virginia Museum of Natural History here in Waynesboro on uh, the Shenan on the South River uh, in Constitution Park. Uh, really good news there, some exciting things going on. We passed our architectural review by the state. Um, we have a building design. We know how much it will cost. Our next hurdle is to get into the capital pool for the next biennium budget. So if you're interested in helping us out, please contact your legislators, be that Delegate Aboli, uh, our new Delegate Campbell, who will be coming into our district, or um, taking over our district because of the redistricting, Senator Hanger um, and others, Mayor Williams. Um, so please encourage them or tell them that, that you like this idea. And if you want to know more about that, I'll be hosting a public session at the library with all the latest information about our building and exhibits. Um, as I mentioned, there are several sponsoring organizations, the Virginia Museum of Natural History, uh, the Center for Cold Waters Restoration, and also the South River Watershed Coalition. And that's a, a fairly new group. You may have known about the issues of mercury contamination on the South River, and I want to bring up Max Quillen to say a few words about this uh, organization. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Max Quillen with the South River Watershed Coalition. Uh, and for those of you who have been coming to these uh, science talks for a while, you might recognize the um, South River Science Team, uh, which is sort of a, a previous um, kind of incarnation of, of the group. Uh, we are 
transitioning towards getting, uh, becoming a nonprofit. Um, so our, our application is in with the IRS to become a 501c3. And um, our, we are a local watershed organization that is finding a direction currently because we're getting set up. Um, and our goal is to protect the watershed and encourage uh, responsible uh, recreation um, and protect the environment. Um, you can learn more uh, at our website, uh, southriverwatershed.org, uh, and we will be revamping that um, over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we could also follow us on Facebook. Uh, we have a, a, a prominent uh, Facebook page uh, with uh, kind of pretty regular updates. And at the bottom of our website, you can uh, sign up for our monthly newsletter, uh, email newsletter, the South River Current. Um, and so please do check out our, our website and uh, stay tuned because you'll be hearing more uh, about the South River Watershed Coalition as we um, kind of get things going. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to talk to me after this, um, or Tom is also on our board, so you could also talk to him. Uh, and um, I look forward to hearing this Raptor talk. Thanks, Max. And once again, we thank, we thank the South River Watershed Coalition. They sponsor our dinner for our, our speaker, and if they are, uh, need to stay overnight, they also do sponsor that. And there are a number of us that are on the boards of many of the organizations that I mentioned, so I encourage you to get connected. Without any further ado, though, I want to bring Peter Niebel up, and he serves also on the Center for Cold Waters Restoration board with me, and he'll be introducing tonight's speaker. Uh, tonight, our speaker is Dr. Vic. Huh? There. Can you hear me without it? I guess you have to. Uh, okay. Uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Vic Laubach. Uh, he's a research professor over at uh, UVA and works on the problem of transplanted lungs being damaged after they are right after they're transplanted. And, uh, but that, that isn't the fun stuff that he does. What he does is he will be talking about the Hawk Watch. Uh, like many of us, he was a pretty hardcore burger as a, as a youth. Uh, but things like education, family, job, that kind of stuff gets in the way, and so you have to kind of stand back from it. But a few years back, he got interested again and uh, took over the organization, or guided the organization of the Hawk Watch to make it a, a more formal kind of operation and easier to follow as far as volunteers went. So five or eight years ago, and you'll find that after about this time of year, it's up here at Afton where the Howard Johnson's is, you find that it's actually really cold a lot of the days. And so 10 years ago, let's say, you'd find maybe one person every, every day or two up there freezing their tail off. But now that Vic's gotten on to it, you find that the the participation is a lot more constant. The data is better because of that. And so you'll find at least one person, sometimes two, almost every day freezing their tails off. <laughs> so we'll let Vic talk about the Hawk Watch itself. Oh, you got one? Thanks so much, Pete. If you, anyone can't hear me, raise your hand, and I will speak closer. How's that? So uh, yeah, as, as Pete mentioned, uh, when I moved to, to Virginia to start my work at UVA in, two, in 1996, I wasn't that involved in the Hawk Watch at all, and then I discovered it a few years later. And in 2006, I became an official counter for the Hawk Watch, and then in 2016, uh, I became the coordinator and so I've been doing it since then. But what we do up there, everything I talk about today is, is a perfect example of citizen science. 
we're all a bunch of citizens, we're all a bunch of uh, volunteers doing this work along with other sites all over North America, and we all contribute to the knowledge of raptors and their migrations, uh, which I really look forward to telling you all about. So I want to uh, quick tell you quickly, many of you saw when you came in, uh, Rich and Mona from our Augusta, local Augusta Bird Club, they're centered in Stanton. So if you have any interest in, in birds or bird ecology, uh, feeding birds, anything like that, our, our bird club is there uh, for you. And we have a great membership of at least 150 people. So we talk about everything from specific bird species to with the best bird seed. We have program speakers every month and it's a nice group of people. And, and the Hawk Watch is a part of the Augusta County Bird Club. So we're partnered with them. So what I wanna tell you about, first of all, I'm gonna tell you about what a raptor is and, and, why, and why and how, the, how they migrate. And then I wanna talk to you about what is a hawk watch and what do we do, how do we do it and why do we do a hawk watch? And then how do we conduct a hawk watch uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and collect the data? And then finally, I wanna introduce you to all the raptors and hawks that we see. So we we'll start with the basics. Here's a raptor. This is a red-tailed hawk. Uh, raptor is a predator, so they're carnivorous. They, they hunt their food. They eat meat. But specifically, they have three special adaptations that really classify them as a raptor. They have this, the hooked beak, which they need to, to grab their prey and to tear off their flesh. They have the keen eyesight, especially on the front of their heads, where they can have binocular vision and, and, you know, and catch their prey. And then finally, they have sharp, strong talons. All those three things are necessary for a raptor to, to survive. And the term raptor is from a Latin word, rapere, which means to seize or grasp. Now, hawks, eagles, falcons, osprey, kites, even owls and vultures, they're all lumped into the group called raptors. And the term hawk is actually a fairly um, common ter term, which we, we use it to, to define a daytime raptor as opposed to owls, which are nighttime. So what we do at our hawk watch is we count hawks, which are diurnal or daytime raptors. And then finally, the term buzzard. How many in here use the word buzzard? It's really, do you, you ever wonder where that comes from? Well, m here, most people refer to it as the vultures flying up in the sky. But it's an actual term from the old world, Europe, when uh, over in Europe, their word for a hawk is, was, is buzzard, and it still is today. So their red-tailed hawk over there is called a common buzzard. It turns out when they started colonizing North America, they started calling all of the vultures they see buzzards, and the name, the name stuck. So why do we study raptors? And well, they are an apex predator. So they're at the top of the food chain. Whatever happens to their environment, at least down here in, in, the, uh, in the, the baseline of the uh, e ecologic pyramid, gets funneled up to the apex predator and we can, we can determine changes in population uh, very easily in these apex predators. And that serves as a barometer of ecologic health overall in, in the environment. And also population studies of raptors help us detect environmental change and this could allow for conservation efforts. So migration, what exactly is migration? Well, what it is not is they don't migrate because they hate the cold and they just wanna go down to green warm areas. It really, they have no choice to migrate and that's because of diminishing resources, especially food. So think about all the thousands and thousands of raptors that are around North America and they're breeding in the spring and summer and they all have their babies and all of a sudden August comes and they all, they've tripled or quadrupled their population. They're gonna run out of food. And one reason they run out of food is because their food disappears. All the amphibians and reptiles disappear when the winter comes. Uh, other animals like the ground squirrels and chipmunks and stuff, they either hibernate or, or disappear. The, uh, and also many birds, a lot of raptors hunt birds and they migrate, many of them migrate. So we have all these raptors up here that just got done nesting and, and breeding 
and they lose their food supply. And so over the millions and millions of years, they've, they've learned that they must, must migrate down where there's better resources. And then down here, they live throughout the winter. And then when the spring comes, they have the urge to breed and raise their young, but they can't do it down here. It's way too crowded. You, 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 it's, too, it's not safe. So they come back up where the resources are, 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 have returned for the spring. So that's what the migration is. So in terms of raptors, and probably a lot of other birds too, there's two types of migration. There's a complete migration. So this is a map of the rough-legged hawk. They breed up in the uh, Arctic in this upper uh, kind of a salmon color. And in the winter, they all leave their breeding ground and come down to the lower 48 states. And then the yellow part shows where you can see them during migration. So this is a complete migration. They all leave their breeding ground and they all go to a new winter ground. But many, many, migra uh, many raptors do a, a partial migration. So here are some of the northern uh, breeding birds uh, that, that breed up here in, in Canada and northern US. They might migrate down part way into North America. And some of the southern birds might migrate part way down into Mexico. And there's a large area where you can see these raptors all year long, but their migration is what we call partial. They don't do a, a, comp a full migration. So again, over millions of years, raptors have learned the best way to migrate. They, they, have, they have defined pathways. So from coming from North America, many raptors funnel down through Central into South America, and they have learned to use very consistent pathways, usually defined by geographic patterns, and they follow these, pa these pathways every year. And one of the pathways is down the Appalachian Mountains, and Rockfish Gap is located right in their path. So that's what makes our, our Hawk Watch and other Hawk Watch sites um, critical. That's why they're located in such critical locations, uh, to, uh, to catch all the raptors in a concentrated fashion. Some of the raptors can migrate over the, over the water, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you more later uh, why, why most of them don't. So here at Rockfish Gap, here, here just a couple miles up the road, how many raptors do we get in the fall? We used to get, back in the eight, early 80s, we used to get up to 25, uh, 20 to 25,000 raptors per year. And then for some reason it dipped during the 90s and 2000s. But in the last 15, 20 years, we're back to getting lots of raptors, almost averaging 30,000 raptors a year. This is through August to November. So the next question is, when do they migrate? They, there, there are 13 species I, I have shown here, and they each kind of migrate a little bit differently in terms of time. So for example, the, the osprey. This is a graph of each week of the season of, of the fall, from August to November. And you can see they st there are always early migrants, there's always late migrants, but their peak is the third week of September, which is coming up very soon. And so that's when we see most of the osprey, that's when we see most of the bald eagles, kestrels, peregrine falcons, and broad winged hawks. These are what, are what will, I guess I would call the early migrants. Then we have some species that kind of shift later, they're kind of a mid-season migrant. The Northern Harrier, Sharp-Shinned Hawk, Cooper's Hawk, Merlin, they have a peak that's a little bit further, a little bit later into uh, the beginning of October. And then finally, we have some late migrants, like the Northern Goshawk, the uh, Red-Shouldered Hawk, Red-Tailed Hawk, Golden Eagle. If you want to see, the, be the best chance to see these birds is during the beginning of November when, as Pete said, it gets very cold up there. Now it's hot, it's, it's quite comfortable. Uh, but it, gets, it can get pretty cold in November. But it's worth the cold to come up there to have a chance to see a golden eagle or a northern goshawk, which are, which are pretty rare. Oh, and I forgot to mention that uh, in the spring, you know, of course they migrate in the spring, but their migration is more diffuse. So the, it's been difficult for, for sites to exist in the spring where they get a good repetitive concentration of raptors. There are a few, but there aren't very many in the spring. Most of them are, are conducted in the fall. So our hawk watch. So what exactly is a hawk watch? Well, simply, it's a systematic effort to collect, count, 
and species data on all of our migrating hawks. This is uh, how we monitor populations. The organization called Hawk Migration Association of North America, or HMANA, they're an international group that collects all this data from hundreds of hawk watch sites around North America, including us, and they tabulate and they store and archive all the data. And more importantly, they're the ones who, who collect all the data and provide it to researchers who want to do studies. When, if you're a researcher and want to want to study raptor population, all you got to do is contact Hamana, and you can get gobs and gobs of data over years and years. And their mission is to advance the scientific knowledge and promote raptor conservation, uh, uh, our conservation of raptor populations through the study and enjoyment and appreciation of raptor migration. Uh, I was recently on the board of Hamana. I'm currently off rotation on the board. Um, but they, they, ha they have a nice, robust group that monitors not just the data, but also the conservation. And uh, now there's a, diff there's a separate climate committee where they try and figure out what's, is what's the link between climate change and raptor migration. Um, but in order to get data that's really useful, this requires accurate, consistent, and long-term data. So doing a hawk watch for a few days or even one year doesn't tell you much. But after decades, then you really build up an, an incredible amount of data. And what we collect up there every day is we record the species, the numbers of birds, the weather, and our sampling effort, which means how many hours we're there every day. All these red dots are different hawk watch sites all around North America. Um, most of them are in the Northeast. But uh, there are pretty good representations of uh, all the different geographic areas, even up as far north as Alaska. Here's a few pictures I thought you might like. Uh, Gunsight Mountain in Alaska is the northernmost hawk watch site. Uh, Pete, you might like that. It's nice and cold. Um, Rockfish Gap is here in Virginia. Wagoner's Gap is up north of us uh, in Pennsylvania. A lot of the birds they see we believe come down our way. And then there's Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania. That's, this is the original Hawk Watch site in, uh, of all Hawk Watch sites in North America, and all the way down to Veracruz, Mexico, and Florida Keys. So one, one thing I wanted to really, really point out to you is that hawks have learned to migrate for millions of years. They've learned the best way to do it. And one thing they've learned is it's risky to fly long distances over open water. It's just risky. And so they avoid water um, in general. So what they do, like up in Canada, these two hawk watch sites, Holiday Beach and Hawk Cliff, they are located here because all these raptors in Canada are migrating south and they hit the Great Lakes and they avoid the water and they, get, they all get funneled through here. That's why they get thousands and thousands of hawks. It's, it's incredible. A similar thing happens on the East Coast. The raptors are migrating down the East Coast. They, they don't go over the water. They follow the coastline. But when they come down and they hit a peninsula, like at the, the end of the Del Delaware Bay at Cape May, or at the Chesapeake Bay in Kiptapeak, then they have to make a decision. What do I do? Um, some of them will decide, I'll, I'll go ahead and cross. But many of them will go around the bay. Um, but during that time when they're down here, you see great concentrations of raptors. So that's a great spot to record them and to, to watch them. Similarly, in the, uh, down inland in the mountains, uh, the raptors have, uh, different raptors have uh, learned to follow the Appalachian Mountains. And I'll tell you more about why in a little bit. So that's why there are, there are key locations, starting at Hawk Mountain, Wagoner's Gap, Snickers Gap, here we are, Rockfish Gap, and then down below us near Roanoke is Harvey's Knob. And a, a lot of the birds we see also continue down to Harvey's Knob. So the birds have learned to use the Appalachian Mountains, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. So here is, if you're sitting at our hawk watch looking north, where the, all the raptors are coming from the north, this is what we see. And you can see this is the I-64 going through here. This is the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Skyline Drive. Out here is Waynesboro. And way up here, just over the ridge out here, is, is Harrisonburg. So we get from that location up at the old inn at Afton. M many of you uh, might know it. 
we can see an incredible view from all the way to the east and to the west and it's a huge wide open sky and our job is to sit there all day and scan the sky and find every raptor that we can possibly find and then identify every raptor and count it and at the end of the day one, one day might give us three or four another day might give us ten thousand it depends on the time of year um, but that's 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 what we do here's a few folks that are volunteers at our hawk watch in one way or another and uh, i really want to tell you about Yuli Larner. Yuli Larner was known as the bird lady of Stanton. Uh, some of you might remember Yuli. She, uh, she used to write lots of newspaper articles for the local paper. She had a regular article about birds every, every week. And Yuli and her colleagues, they were looking for places to, to find raptors around here. And they looked at lots of different mountains and ridges. And they narrowed it down to Rockfish Gap. Here's some early pictures of early hawk watchers. And she, she uh, founded our Hawk Watch, and th she decided that Rockfish Gap is the most consistent um, location in our uh, uh, Shenandoah Valley area to, to get repetitive um, counts of raptors every year. Here's a couple of pictures at, of our Hawk Watch. So in the summer, we like to uh, sit here next to the inn in the shade, and we get a nice view of the Rockfish Gap up to the north. It's, it's quite comfortable. But when the cold weather does come, we do ship out here into the, into the nearby parking lot where it's warmer in the sun and the asphalt gives us a little bit of heat. Um, unless it's really, really windy, it, it's not too bad. So there are a few types of people that are involved in the Hawk Watch, starting with myself as the coordinator. The co yet every Hawk Watch site has a coordinator and their job is to represent the Hawk Watch site and also to uh, to uh, record, they archive all the records. And I'm also make sure we have good quality control, make sure our counters are trained. If someone wants to be a counter, if anyone here wants to be a counter, we can train you. Um, all it takes is time. Um, it, it can, it can uh, take some time. W and I also coordinate the counters every, every season because we, we try to cover every single day, except it's, unless it's raining. So in order to get good, consistent data, you want to be there every day. So even a day where you have no raptors, that's data. It's a data, a number of zero, but it's still valuable data. And next we have the core of the hawk watch. These are the counters. These are the people that are qualified to identify and count our hawks. They're the ones who do the live data recording at the hawk watch. I, if you go to a, the ho if you come up to our hawk watch, any given day there is one person who's designated as the official counter even though other potential counters might be there. There's one person who's designated the counter, and that person's job is to manage the operation of the Hawk Watch on that day. So they, were, they would do things like designate chores to different people, or sometimes there's a crowd up there and it's too noisy. It's their job to keep control of people. One of the worst things that happens up there is when we have hundreds or thousands of hawks in the sky and the counter's trying to count them, and you have six people out there counting out loud. <laughs> That's when we say, everyone quiet. <laughs> give, me, give me 10 minutes to really count these birds. So, uh, it, but it's all fun. And then we have observers. These are people who aren't quite counters, but they're there. They help the counter find birds in the sky. It's a huge sky, so the more eyes up there, the better. We don't want to miss any raptors. And uh, finally, we have lots of visitors who are up there just to enjoy the show. We have lots of visitors, and everyone, anyone is welcome up there anytime. It's, it's totally open. Uh, a couple of details. Here are two sheets of data that, or these are two data sheets that we use every day to record live data. So this first page shows the raptors on each row, like uh, osprey, bald eagle, etc. Each row is a different raptor, and we count the number of raptors in during each hour. So we have different hourly counts in throughout the day. So all this raw data is then summarized and transferred to page two. So on this particular day, we had 8,707 raptors. And, um, and you can look through the different species. Most of them were broad wings. But we also record things like other counters that are there, observers. We like to, we like to record names of visitors. 
We record other interesting birds we see, and we even count monarch butterflies, and I'll, I'll tell you more about those. Another thing we, ma we make sure we record every hour is the weather, the, detail, the details of the, the wind direction, the wind speed, whether it's cloudy, the humidity, pressure, all that stuff. Uh, so researchers can use that data to try and do their correlative studies. Uh, when, when, so when all this, uh, I get this sheet every night from the counter. Uh, they, they usually scan it or take a picture and send it to me. And then I tabulate all their numbers and double check all their numbers. And then I submit it online to the, uh, the Hawk Count website. This is where Hamana stores and records all of their data from all over North America. So this is a summary of that day in one page. And you can go look at this on the website, and you can look up any, any day you want, back 20, 30 years from our, from, for our Hawk Watch, and you can pick any day, and you can bring up the, the sheet for that day. It's kind of fun to go back. You can also look at the, uh, the, our Hawk counts by the month. Here's the month of September in 2019. Every day, you can see, like right now, what's today? Today's the 12th. Um, today we had, I heard we had 60 couple birds today. So we're still in the double digits. But next week, we're going to get into triple digits. And then by the, by the 20th, we're going to start hopefully getting into the uh, thousands or tens of thousands of hawks. Uh, that's coming up in the next, next two weeks. So if you're a raptor, a little raptor, you'd only weigh a few ounces, and you want to get to South America, you've got, you got a big road ahead of you. And you need want to make it there without starving or wasting your energy and falling out of the sky and in exhaustion. So they have, they have um, evolved to use two techniques, and that is soaring and gliding. When, uh, so the two techniques they use utilize different winds. Uh, one is called an updraft. Uh, when the wind hits the mountain, one is called a thermal. Now the thermal, or the updraft, is when we have here at Rockfish Gap, our best day for an updraft is northwest wind. It hits the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it rises up, and it g the speed of the wind concentrates up here near the peak. So when these raptors find that, they, they hit the sweet spot, and they can just glide for miles, like a surfer riding a wave. And they can do that without flapping at all. So that, that is really uh, an energy saver. Another technique is thermal lift. So the sun heats up various, uh, various parts of the ground, and you get this heat rising. If a raptor, a raptor finds this, it will rise up hundreds and hundreds of feet, and it's a free elevator ride up. They don't have to flap. All they do is, is uh, soar. And when they do this in large groups, this is called a kettle. You've seen, probably seen vultures flying around in circles. Well, the raptors do the same thing. And sometimes we can see uh, you know, two or three or several thousand in, in, in one kettle. Now what they do is they ride this thermal up in the air in a spiral. Eventually the thermal ends and they leave the thermal and they glide southward, sometimes for miles. Still, they don't have to flap. They're basically coasting and taking advantage of all the winds. They find another thermal, they rise up, and they do this all the way to South America. So they, they try and do this as uh, efficiently as possible. Here is one kettle taken in, it's a picture from our Rockfish Gap Hawk Watch by Diane Lipkowski. This is one kettle of a good number of broadwing hawks. Those, these are broadwing hawks in a thermal. This is probably a couple hundred feet high. There's a 1,500 hawks in this one, in, in this one kettle. And you might, what you're thinking is true. We can't count them when they're in here. <laughs> so they're in here, they're swirling around. We just, we just watch them and admire them. But eventually, when they reach the top, the thermal ends, and they leave the, ther the thermal and start streaming off one by one. That's when we get out our clicker, and we just click them, every single one. And as we're clicking these birds at the top, the lower birds are rising, and they eventually all rise and leave the kettle, and they all get clicked on our counter, and we get a pretty good, accurate count. And, and if we're lucky, we get a nice cooperative kettle like this. Sometimes they're not as cooperative. Sometimes you have three kettles in the sky at once, and sometimes they merge. 
it, it can be it can be quite exciting up there. You never know what you're going to get. Sometimes the kettle can be so far out there you can only see it with the with the scope, of of like 50 power scope, and you see these little gnats flying. But we we count them. Here's a video of a kettle right above our hawk watch last year. A small kettle. These these birds these are ha broad wing hawks. They just left the kettle. They're all gliding southward and know they will be gliding for a while and looking for a new kettle eventually. Here's another video from down in Panama. Now in Panama, imagine all the raptors in North America, all of them being funneled through the little isthmus of Panama. That's a lot of birds. So this is an example of one of their kettles. They can get 50,000 in one kettle. I'm not sure how they count them, but but they, they get hundreds of thousands of, of hawks. And, and our, most of our hawks, if not all of them, go th pass through their site. So our job is to identify these hawks too, right, not just count them. So we depend on certain key elements, including size, shape, behavior. And if we can get a close look, we can see their markings. And there's two really good books that help us. That's Hawks in Flight and hawks at a distance. They were really good books written for, for identifying hawks, especially when they're flying. So normally, if, if anyone out here bird watches or you got birds at your bird feeder, you get a nice view of a bird like this that's not too far away. These, this is a red-shouldered hawk and a, and a kestrel. Uh, you can see every feather. You can see every detail. Beautiful. But we don't see this at the hawk watch. We, we never see this. What we see is this. So we see these moving shapes in the distance. And so all we have to depend on are their size, their shape, how they're flying. They have different habits of how they fly. And sometimes we can see a few details, like you can see a stripe on this, this, this guy's tail. Or this, um, this raptor here has especially long wings. This is an osprey, for example. And all these cues we have to assemble in our brain to come up with an identification. Some examples of sizes, the, our four smallest raptors are the kestrel, sharp-shinned, hawk, merlin, and the cooper's hawk. These are pretty, these are really small, not much bigger than a, than a blue jay. They can easily sit right on, the, on your hand. And then the mid-sized raptors include the peregrine falcon, the broad-winged hawk, the northern harrier, and you all probably know the red-tailed hawk you see all along the highways all the time. This is a, a little bit, these are big, this is bigger than a, a broad-winged hawk but these are all mid-sized. Now we get the really big ones down here. You almost need two hands to hold them. The osprey, the golden eagle, and the bald eagle. And those of you, some of you might recognize uh, Ed Clark from the Wildlife Center here. And then there's shape. This is probably one of our key elements that we use because lots of times you really can't estimate their size. If it's one bird way out there, it's hard to tell what size it is. You don't have much to compare it to. So you focus on their shape. So these are some categories of shapes, including the falcons. There are three falcons that have this shape, three occipiters here. There's one kite. There are four raptors uh, in the class of Budios. There's one harrier, one osprey, and two eagles. And those, these are their general shapes. So what I want to do now is I want to introduce you to all of our raptors. And I'll start with the occipiters. These include the sharp-shinned hawk, Cooper's hawk, and northern goshawk. Now the exhibitors, they live in forests. They hunt other birds, but they hunt them through trees. So that's why they have this shape. They have a long tail. That's their rudder. That allows them to make these lightning fast turns. But they have these short, wide wings so they can maneuver between the trees. And that's what they're built for. And that's what they, they use to survive. Now here's our sharp-shinned hawk. Uh, this is a small occipiter. That notice the long tail. And the sharp shin hawks, most of them will breed up in northern uh, North, North America. Many of them will live all year long in central uh, lower 48 states. But we get a lot of migrants from up to the north through, through Virginia down into the southern U.S. So our average every year is 1,821 sharp shin hawks. Our biggest year was 3,654, and our biggest single day for sharp shins was 509. 
And if you look at their numbers, I'll have a graph for every raptor. If you look at their numbers over the years, they, there were a lot of sharp shinned hawks in the early 80s, and their, their populations kind of went down. But in the last 10, 15 years, our numbers have come back up and are fairly stable at about 1,800 birds a year. Here's a couple pictures of the sharp shin. Again, they're small. Um, they also have a small, small head relative to other raptors, and they have a, a long tail that's squared off. So you can see this square, square tail. And the immature has all these streaks, but the mature bird, after a year or two, they get this uh, kind of an orange barring underneath. And um, many times, if they come in at a distance, you can't see these, but many of them come toward us from the north and fly right over our heads. You oftentimes get a really good look at them. Here's a characteristic of the sharp shinned hawk that really helps you identify them, and that's the way it flies. It's called a flap, flap, flap glide. Watch the slapping, now it's gliding. Now it's flapping like a butterfly. It, now it's gliding. It'll flap again. That's its habit. That's what they do. If we see that, then we, we know what, what we have. The Cooper's hawk will fly like that too, but they're more, they're stronger birds. They, have, don't, they don't flap as, as uh, fast. And here's the Cooper's hawk. It's a little bigger than a sharp shinned. They live, they live around here all year long, but we, there's a large northern population that migrates down through Virginia, and we get, up to, we get an average of 333 per year, or per, uh, per fall season. We've had as many as 455, and we've had as many as 43 in one day. Their numbers over the years seem to be uh, actually increasing at Rockfish Gap. The Cooper's hawk looks like a sharp shin, but if you compare the two, which I, I, I forgot to put a side-by-side -side comparison, but they have a larger head. They're larger overall in size, uh, but their tail is usually rounded with a white, uh, white uh, stripe at the end of their tail, and that's, what, that's how we can tell them. But the immatures, like the sharp shins, are, are streaked. The matures have this orange swath of uh, barring uh, on their underside. And then the big, go the big occipiter, the goshawk. Uh, this is a large exhibitor, probably along the size of a red-tailed hawk, and, but it's a northern bird. They live up in, in uh, uh, Canada, and, th and they live up there all year long. We rarely get goshawks down into Virginia. Out west, they get them, but not here. We get an average of seven, so we're really lucky when we see one or two, especially seven. We've had as many as 18. And we've had, the most we've had in one day is actually three, which is really, was really amazing. Here's the goshawk. The adult is very, very uh, outstanding, very big. Uh, the, notice the large black uh, stripe, sort of a stripe or a, sw a swatch behind their eye. And they also have a n very noticeable white eyebrow over their head. You, it's hard to see on this picture, but they're nice kind of a light gray barring all throughout the underside. They're, they're pretty unmistakable. They're very big, the pointed, almost pointed wings. The, the immature is very streaked and very dark, so they, it's easy to tell the two apart. But sometimes this one gets very difficult to tell from maybe a large Cooper's hawk. They, they, they can look similar. It depends on how good of a view you get. So the next class are the Budios. So these include the red-tailed hawk, Broadwing hawk and the red shouldered hawk. All of these are pretty common around here, uh, the red, especially the red tailed hawk. So these birds are designed to fly and take advantage of the thermals and the air currents while they hunt. They hunt over the fields, usually from a high distance. So they're designed to just float around up in the sky and without flapping too much. And so that's why they have this long, broad wings and a kind of a short, broad tail. So here's the red tail and Red tails are very common. They live all throughout the southern U.S., or, or the 48 states. The, but there's a large population that breed up in Canada, and we get a lot of them during migration. We get 879 on average at, at Rockfish Gap. We have had one year where we had 2,100. Uh, in one day, we've had as many as 751. And their populations at Rockfish Gap look fairly stable over the years. Here's the classic adult red-tailed hawk. They have a red tail. Uh, the lower, the bottom side of the tail is not very red, but the upper side 
you can really tell. If you see this, you've got yourself a red-tailed hawk. And they have a classic belly band across the middle of their belly, and they have these dark marks on their shoulders called patagio marks, and they have these little black commas in their wings. So if you see this combination, you've got yourself a red-tailed hawk. Next is the broad wing hawk. This is our smallest beauty. They live in the forest, so that's probably one reason why they're smaller. They love to eat amphibians, especially frogs, salamanders, and, and reptiles that they find on the forest floor, which is probably one reason why they leave their breeding grounds up north in huge numbers so quickly, because all of a sudden on the first freeze, all of their prey is underground. All of their amphibians and reptiles um, salamanders, they're, they're, they're gone in a day. So when they move, when they decide to migrate, they move in huge, massive numbers. We get uh, 20 th an average of 23,000 lately at, at Rockfish Gap over the last 15 years. And we're, we're the largest, we're the hawk watch site of the, that gets the largest number of broad wing hawks on the eastern flyway. We have had as many as 33,000 one year. This was in when is that, 2010? And our single day record has been 11,700. It's a small raptor, but you can tell if you have a broad wing, if you see a small butio with these broad black and white tail bands and this black, kind of an eyeliner type color on the trailing edge of their wings. And they have relatively pointed wings when they're gliding. The immature is more streaked, but it has the same, and, and the tail isn't banded like the adult. So they can be a little bit more challenging to identify. And then the red-shouldered hawk, they, we have a, plenty of those around here that live all year long. They hunt and live in mixed forest and trees. So you'll find them either in fields or in forests. And, but a lot of them breed up north and they migrate through Virginia. We get an average of 94. We've had a season record of 168. And in one day, our record has been 23. So their numbers have been pretty good at Rockfish Gap. You know, they have some variation, but in general, they seems to be stable or going up a little bit. The red-shouldered hawk is quite outstanding in the sky. It flies a little different than any other raptor. It's much more active. It does more, more rapid wing beats. If you see, red tails are kind of lazy. They'll be flying around just lazy. If you see a raptor that's big but sh and shaped sort of like a red tail, but it's being very active, and energetic, it's, it's probably a red shoulder. And if you look closely, you can see the field marks of the stripes with the thin white band, an overall orange swath underneath for the adult. The immatures, like many of the other raptors, the immatures um, are mostly boldly streaked. I think a lot of the immatures are probably streaked, in my opinion, um, just to help protect them and, and camouflage them while they're really young, while they're still learning and fledging. So next we have the falcons. We have three falcons, the kestrel, the merlin, and the peregrine falcon. And they have distinctive shapes like you see here, very sickle shaped, long pointed wings, a streamlined body going right into the tail. They are built for speed and open, open air. They survive by hunting birds in open, open air. So they need to be the fastest, most agile bird out there. And that, that's their job especially the peregrine falcon. Uh, so when we see a, a small, well, most of the Kestrel and Merlin are small, the peregrine is large, but if we see the silhouette, we know we have at least a, 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 uh, a falcon of some sort. Now when you look more closely, you get some details. Like this is the little Kestrel. You often see them perched on power lines, or so they can even hover over the field. They can hover briefly, in, very still, while they're hunting for mice on the ground. And they live around here all year long, as well as all across the U.S. But this huge northern population migrates south, and we get a lot of them. We get 209 every year on average. We can, we've gotten as many as 400, and our one-day record has been 88. And again, their population at Rockfish Gap seems to be uh, edging upward. Here's a few pictures of the kestrel. The male is pretty colorful. They got this nice rufous on the back with some kind of a bluish slate color. They have this nice little thin mustache under their eye, both the male and the female. The female is more brown and blotchy on the top. And then if you get a good view of the kestrel from underneath, 
and you see a small uh, shape like this that's a, that's a falcon, and you see these little circular windows in the, the wings, you, you, if the sun's shining, you'll, it'll be obvious, and you know you have yourself a kestrel. Next to Merlin, Merlin is, is in almost in a class of its own. It's, it's a, small, a small falcon. It doesn't really breed around here. In the eastern U.S., they don't breed. They breed up in Canada, but we see a, a lot of them come through in the east to, uh, to their wintering ground. We get 49 on average. Our record has been 85 in one season, and we've seen as many as 10 in one day. They are, their numbers are going notably up over the last 10, 15 years which is kind of nice to see. I, I don't have an explanation for that, but they are consistently uh, more nowadays in the last 10 years than there were in, in the prior uh, 20, 30 years. Now the Merlin is special because I would say it's our fastest raptor. Uh, most raptors that we see, we can first see it up in front of us somewhere and we can watch it for you know, a minute or two minutes or sometimes 10 minutes till it flies by. Not the Merlin. The Merlin will give you about 10 seconds to see it, and it's gone. It is, you have to be on the lookout, and it's incredible. They are feisty birds. They will attack other birds. A lot of Hawkwatch sites have put up a fake uh, plastic owl at their Hawkwatch site just to entice the Merlins to come down and dive bomb it. Um, they, they are quite a, quite a bird. But they're small, but if you get a good look, you'll notice that they are dark, they got the dark bands in their tail, and even underneath, they're very dark. Uh, and they have kind of a, kind of, I would call it a strong, uh, wide tail, as opposed to a kestrel, which is more thin and dainty looking. So that's our Merlin. And then finally, the largest falcon, the peregrine, our fastest falcon. It can stoop at over 200 miles an hour on, on a bird. They uh, breed up in the north and way up here and in the west. We don't get many, but they do migrate down here, and they usually migrate down the coast, and they can winter along the coastline. That's why Kiptopeak Hawk Watch out on the, Delaware, on the Chesapeake Bay gets a lot of peregrines. We don't get many, but we get 41 on average a year coming down through the Appalachian Mountains and in the, in the Blue Ridge. We have had as many as 65, and our single day record has been 17, so they are quite a sight to see when you see one. They stand out. And their numbers actually look like uh, they're on the uprise, at least at Rockfish Gap. Here's a couple pictures. The adult, again, is big, a large falcon, pointed wings, very long, strong body with a, a tapered tail. And they have this bold, big mustache mark on the side of their cheeks, which is, you can see that from a long distance. And they got this nice dark gray barring underneath. Again, the immatures, like other raptors, are very heavily streaked but you can see the really bold mustache mark. If you see that, then you got yourself a peregrine. Eagles, we have two. Uh, you know the bald eagle, and we do get some golden eagles. These are birds for, these are built for just soaring. They can soar for hours up in the sky. That's why they have huge, long, wide, almost uh, like, a, like a two by 10 plank of wood up in the sky, six to seven foot wingspan. The bald eagle, we all know, Here's a nice, handsome adult. Their numbers have been screaming high in the last 10, 15 years. It's incredible. We used to never see them or rarely see them. They used to bring such excitement and, and, you know, and even get an applause if we see them back in these days. Now we, we see them every day. Uh, they've gotten quite common. We can see as many as 83 in one day. Our season record is 426, but we're averaging three, about 300 per season. This year, we don't know, we, it might even be higher. Most of the population uh, nest up in Canada, but a lot of them will nest along the coast too. Um, but they migrate a lot down through the Appalachian and Blue Ridge Mountains. Here's uh, the adult bald eagle. Uh, they reach this, this look with the white head and tail at age five, but when they're young, they are, they're dark with white splotching. So we do keep track of immature versus adults when we're counting. Next is the golden eagle. Yeah, this is a really delight when we see one of these. We don't see many, only 21 per year on average. We have seen as many as 40. In one day we've seen, uh, one, one time we had six in one day, which was incredible. 
But these are northern birds up in the Arctic Circle or out west. But they do migrate down to our area in the winter. A few of them do come down to Virginia. If you were to go to Highland County in the winter, you, you'll see, that's your best chance of seeing a golden eagle in the winter. So here's what a golden eagle looks like in adult, pretty much all dark, but they have the golden nape, the feathers behind the head, that's what gives it its name. And the, the immature looks a lot like the adult, but they have these little white marks in their wings, and especially the base of their tail is a bold white. So if we see a large eagle way out in the distance and it flashes, if it turns just right and it shows this big, bold, white face of the tail, that's a golden eagle. There are multiple harriers around the world. We have one called the northern harrier. Now these, are, these birds, uh, we don't see many in the summer here, but when they hunt, they hunt low over the fields. And they're built for, for keeping themselves aloft while they maneuver uh, over and over around the, uh, the landscape looking for mice that they can, they can uh, attack at, at a moment's notice. So that's why they have a long tail and very long wings to keep them uh, efficiently hunting. And that also is why when you see them, they, they have a very active kind of a, kind of a rocking motion when they fly. And they hold their wings in a dihedral, which is a V shape. So they have a good, they have a distinctive uh, flight pattern that really stands out. Here's a picture of a northern harrier. They're also known as the owl-faced hawk. And as I said, we don't get many of them here in the summer. We mostly get a lot in the winter coming down from Canada. We get 69 on average. We have had as many as 159 in a season, and our day record has been 23. And their numbers uh, look fairly consistent over the last 20 years. Here's the northern harrier. The, uh, the males are nice light gray, beautiful birds with the really dark wing tips. The females are, uh, you know, they have the same shape in flight, but they have the light streaking underneath and streaking on their wings. And then if we see a harrier that looks kind of orange underneath, th that's a young one, one, uh, one or uh, 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 less than one year old. So that's a, a newly uh, fledged uh, harrier. And then the osprey, you, a lot of you probably know the osprey, especially when you go to the beach, they're there. They, they don't nest here um, in our area very much, but they will nest in, in, uh, on the coast. They are fish eaters. They got very long wings. And when you see them flying, you'll, that's the first thing you'll notice. But you also notice that they usually hold their wing in a crooked M shape. I don't know why, but uh, it's kind of nice they do that because it helps us identify them. Uh, but they also have bold black and white colors. So that's, you can see that here on this guy is carrying dinner. Uh, they got this really nice black stripe behind their eye. Uh, they're a beautiful bird, one of my favorite raptors. We get a lot migrating through Virginia from Canada and all the way down. They, are, they, they go, a lot of them will go and stay in Florida, but most of them go over the water, over the Gulf of Mexico into South America. We get as many as 268. So we we usually see them every day, at least during September. Season record is 373. Our one day record has been 45. Their numbers, uh, they look pretty good too over the last 15, 15 years. They've been uh, better than prior decades. So here's our osprey. Sometimes they hover real briefly, like this guy on the right. Um, when they're over a body of water, they want to get a good look at the fish. And then our last raptor is a newcomer. This is a Mississippi kite. We're not used to seeing these. We never used to get them. And all of a sudden, one popped up in 1998. It's like, ah, oh, that's an anomaly. Well, then another anomaly here and there. All of a sudden, we got this. So these kites are a southern bird. They, they nest and breed in southern U.S. and maybe up the Mississippi Valley a little bit. And they migrate to South America. And that's what they've done for thousands of years. And they rarely were seen up here. And all of a sudden, in the last 10 years, people started seeing them in Ohio, uh, in Illinois, in Pennsylvania. And there's a really nice nesting colony in northern Virginia. So we are, we are really getting a consistently good number of birds every, every year. We're averaging four. We have had as many as 10. This year, we've already had five this year. So they are quite a nice sight to see. 
They're a little bit unusual. They're, they're actually not carnivorous. They usually eat bugs. So they spend, it's almost like a, almost like a swift or a swallow. They're up in the air. They spend all day long in the air catching bugs. Here's an adult. He's got a, some kind of a bug he's eating. On, they often eat on the fly. They, they, they don't bother perching, at least during migration. We see them up there catching bugs, and they reach down and eat their bug, and they'll go off and catch more, bur more bugs. But the adult is mostly all gray with a dark tail and a light head. Very beautiful birds. And you see the long, slender wings and, and pointed. It's, they really stand out. They're a very, very elegant bird. The young birds, again, like other raptors, are very streaked underneath. But they have this nice, nice um, striping in their tail, which, which designates what they are. So those are our raptors, uh, it, it, at least here at Rockfish Gap. Out west, they have some additional species we don't get, like a Swainson's hawk or a rough-legged hawk. Once in a while, we might see one or the uh, one or, either, or either of those, but they're they're very rare. Uh, I haven't mentioned vultures. We have black vultures and turkey vultures. They are technically a raptor. Uh, some places up north, they count them because they migrate by the hundreds. But here at Rockfish Gap, they just meander all over the sky. We don't know whether they're migrating or not. So there's no use in counting them. One, one year, someone counted all the all the vultures going south, and they, on a separate ca clicker, they counted all the ones going north. At the end of the day, they had more going north than south. So, <laughs> yeah. But they are entertaining. If if we see raptor, I mean, if we see vultures flying in the morning, and uh, it, it's a good sign we'll see raptors that day. Uh, one slide I want to show you about their population. So Hamana, along with Hawk Mountain, does a raptor population index every few years where they accumulate all the data from long-term Hawk Watch sites, and they do this very, very involved statistical analysis, which takes into effect the number of days and the number of hours and what, what the weather was like and over the years. Um, and they can look at trends and population numbers. So when, if you look at one site, you don't, that doesn't give you much information about what's happening across the continent. That's what this helps with. So you see basically two symbols. The blue dots are hawk watch sites which show, for example, here the sharpshin hawk seems to be stable in population. But there are other places, especially in the east, where all these downward red arrows mean that they are significantly dropping in their numbers every year year after year, and you see this everywhere. Um, it's very common on all of our raptors, and y you see this even with songbirds. I mean, it, that's, that's, that's what happens, probably mostly due to their habitat loss, especially during nesting season. They, they really need the habitat. However, the bald eagle is, is different. The bald eagles are going up, and I think the reason the bald eagles are going up is because the bald eagles really don't, they're a raptor, but they're an opportunistic bird. They, they'll hunt something if they're hungry, but they'll take easy, easy pickings. They'll steal from other animal, other, other birds easily. They'll eat carrion, dead animals like a vulture. They'll, 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 uh, you'll see them at, at dumps eating scraps. So they, can, they really have adapted. I think that is a good word, and their, their, adaptive, uh, their adaptive capability is really strong. These other birds are very, very sensitive, more sensitive to their uh, uh, surroundings. And I want to end with a couple of slides about non-raptors. So we, we love to count at Rockfish Gap. And we, one thing we count are hummingbirds. They migrate too. And when we're sitting up there watching for raptors, we can see uh, hummingbirds zipping by over, head and south, straight south like an arrow. And we count them, and we get an average of 280 every fall. We've had as many as 168 zip over in one day. So they're, they're pretty cool to see. We also count monarch butterflies. We cooperate with the monarch uh, butterfly group um, across the that, that monitors populations across the country, and we submit our data to them. And we count them on, on good days coming up, usually in the latter part of September. That's when they will be migrating in big numbers. We usually see over 1,000, and some days, when you're looking for raptors, their monarch butterflies are so thick, we have a trouble finding the raptors. So if the wind is just right, and the monarchs are at their peak migration, 
it's quite a phenomenon to see that up, up at the Hawk Watch. But re what's really I found interesting is we had one, two years, 2013 and 2004, which we had just hardly any at all, and we were all worried about them. Well, they all bounced back. So it's incredible how adaptive uh, nature can be. We also try to keep track of dragonflies. Sometimes we'll count them. Sometimes they're so thick you can't see the raptors. Uh, we're starting to see them now. They're really thick. Uh, the regal darner is the biggest one. The green darner is the most common one. This guy here has a, is a researcher that tags uh, butter, uh, dragonflies and found out that they can fly up to 40 miles in less than a week. And some, some, uh, some dragonflies will migrate 100 to 200 miles. So they're, I found that quite interesting. Now, they, they're similar to the monarch. They're, it takes them one generation to migrate, for example, south to their winter ground. And then they lay, egg, they may lay eggs and die, and then their progeny may, migrates north in the spring. And they lay, may, may lay eggs and, and they die, and their progeny um, migrate south and forever and ever. So I hope I gave you a good taste of what happens up at our Hawk Watch and what, what goes on and, and what, what's involved in our citizen science project. And as I mentioned, it's open to any visitors and we welcome visitors. And if, even if someone's interested to get involved in some way, we'll welcome that too. So thanks for, thanks for coming by and listening. I think this is a Q&A time. Yes, uh, thanks Vic. And uh, for those that want to ask some questions, I'd ask you to wait for the microphone as we do have an online audience as well. So we'd like the online audience to hear. And maybe I'll ask for Max's help. If you would take the microphone on this side of the theater. And I'll just Absolutely. Yeah, I was wondering, you, you talk about flyways when the birds are like, or the raptors are, are flying, migrating to South America. Yeah, yeah. Don't they get counted like maybe twice, three times in various different viewing stations? And how do they work that out to show what the overall yeah. total is from what they put together for the, as far as the, total migration yeah that uh, that's a great question of, of course they get counted twice like a lot of our raptors at rockfish might get counted at harvey's knob um, but each each site is represents its own site and it's not compared to other sites but it, it's analyzed as what's happening there and then but the important thing is you're combining uh different hundreds of hawk watch sites around the country to do a, a large scale analysis that's where you see trends that are significant or consistent trends. And the more data points you can get for that, the better your data is and the higher your significance could be. Uh, I, don't, I don't think, so we're not so much involved in our total numbers of raptors as we are in how they're changing over the year, or okay. over the years. Yeah. That's what I thought, okay, yeah. thank you. Victor, I, uh, I wanna congratulate, congratulate you on a great talk, but you mentioned earlier that the raptors going south now are highly organized, but when they return north, they're very unorganized, diffuse. Why is that? I was afraid you were gonna ask that. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows. Uh, I know that many sites try to count raptors going north. They never get the, the numbers they get in the fall. S and it, they seem to be just more dispersed when they're migrating north for some reason. Now, remember, when they're migrating north, they, they, they see a totally different weather pattern than coming south. I think the weather patterns coming south in the fall are probably a lot more stronger and consistent over the eons of years, maybe versus the springtime. Um, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but some sites do get a good number of uh, spring migrants, and they are counting them and they have their own analysis that they can do. But there aren't nearly as many as there are in the fall. And that's all I can think of is that maybe a lot of the spring migrants are, um, 
there's a total different geography too, in addition to the weather. A lot of the a lot of the winds in the eastern U.S. are are the northwest winds. Is that when they hit the Appalachian Mountains, which angle against that wind, that really concentrates the birds. They're just don't they don't. There's nothing. I don't think there is a strong weather pattern or geographic um, pattern that allows for concentration as much as concentration of hawks in the spring. Even though they're, the numbers are still going north, they're, I think they're just more spread out. Other question? You mentioned the insect eaters, but are the other raptors that eat uh, rodents and so on, are they feeding along the way? How often do they have to eat? Yeah, that's a, that's a question that a lot of people ask, and I don't think anyone knows exactly, but yeah, they, they definitely eat along the way. Uh, but they don't eat very much. They, they, they're, they fly. That's what they do. When the weather's good, they fly. They might eat maybe the end of the day or in the beginning. Sometimes we'll see them early, uh, early rising in the morning, and they looks like they're hunting. And sometimes we see them actually hunting on the ridge line when we're counting. Sometimes a raptor will, will come down from their migration and start gliding along looking for squirrels or something in the trees, and we sometimes they dive in. So, yeah, they do eat. But the more they can glide and soar, the less they have to eat. Uh-oh, this is my son. <laughs> I was afraid of this. Um, so, you know I've been up at the Hawk Watch many times. I'd be curious, um, would you be able to give kind of a brief overview of maybe your one of most memorable, day, memorable days up at the Hawk Watch? Yeah. Um, one does come to my mind right now. It was about five years ago, third week of September. We were in the big week. We had a lot of people up there, people, lots of visitors, probably 100 plus, and we had five or six different counters, and the, the broad wings were coming. And I remember one day, probably late morning, we saw our first kettle of a thousand or so off to the east. And as soon as we saw that kettle, about 30 seconds later, someone spotted a kettle way out to the west of another several thousand birds. And someone, another, and so I was counting these, and I said to my, I said to the counter next to me, I said, you cover these, I'm gonna run over there. And I ran as fast as I could to the end of the building to get the next several thousand. As soon as I got there, a third kettle appeared up north, straight ahead. And we, I think we ended up with four different kettles and, and finally ended up with about 7,000 birds that hour. Uh, that was exciting. Um, that's, that's a memorable moment. And we're just, we're all just clicking with our thumbs. You're clicking as you see that. You don't, we don't count them in our mind. We, we, we just click. And so if you count, you're going to lose count. So you just use the clicker. And our thumbs were sore, sore as can be after that. But we got them all. And that, that's what we try to do. Those are fun days. Do you have a sense of how long it takes a broad wing to go from start to South America? I'm sure it's different for all species, but. Yeah, there, there are, um, I should know that, but there have been studies where broad wings were tagged in their breeding location, and they were able to follow them all the way to South America. Matter of fact, I saw a post the other day online where this one broad wing was tagged three years ago, and, and it's still working. Their, their GPS tag is still working. So they're tracking it for a third year in a row from uh, New Hampshire all the way down to uh, almost Panama. But I don't recall the time it took, but I, I think it's, it's, prob it's probably only a few weeks for them to get down there. Because I know when, when we get our big push up here, which will be next week, Panama won't get their huge push probably for another week or two, um, which is, which makes sense for all the birds from up here to get down there. So I, I would estimate a couple, maybe a couple weeks. Mm. It depends on the weather. They could get there quicker. We, uh, when the broad wings are ready to, to fly in giant groups, they will fly unless it's just pouring down rain. Uh, they'll fly through fog, they'll fly through thick clouds, they'll fly in heavy wind, no wind. Um, they, for some reason, they have the incredible urge to migrate, and they'll do it. 
One day we were up there and the fog was so low, the sky, the ceiling of the clouds was so low, we, we could barely even see Crozet from, from up there. I mean, the ceiling, the fog was like right above your head. And we, we, were, we were not having much hope for seeing hawks. And it was so dark and dreary, threatening rain. And someone looked out to the, to the east in the Piedmont toward Crozet, I mean toward Charlottesville. And someone with, with good eyes spotted a few little dark specks flying. And I got my spotting scope on those specks and it turned into thousands of specks flying just straight low over the, under the clouds. They were, they were sneaking by and they weren't, um, they weren't waiting. And we got several thousand right there. Um, so they're, they're an incredible bird. Um, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed your talk tonight. The um, data that you produce, that gets produced daily, how quickly does that get on, I assume it does get on your website? When I get home tonight, I, my, my chore is to put today's data up online. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, and my sister and I um, knew an ornithologist, and we're theorizing that they're in no hurry when they're going north <laughs> because they're looking for real estate. That Actually, I think that's a good theory. They, they aren't pushed probably as... as uh, strongly as the fall. Yeah, in the fall they lose their food very rapidly. Yeah, you could be yeah, you could be on to something. I just wanted to thank you for your slides. They are incredible. I don't know whether oh. you put them together or whoever did it. It it was just marvelous. This whole thing was just so I I need to see it again though so it'll really sink in. <laughs> but I loved it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. A lot of the I always had my camera. That gives me an opportunity to remind you that we do tape these, so you can go back onto YouTube and see this again if you'd like. Yeah, I always had my camera handy because there are lots of times where we see something unusual or something rare, and I want to be ready to document it. And, but I, I love the photography too. Maybe time for one more question. When uh, there are days with large con concentrations of hawks at dusk, have you ever noticed uh, large con concentrations roosting? Oh, that's a great point, you know. <coughs> yes, when the end of the day comes, the thermals start disappearing, the air starts cooling, and the raptors will start coming down, and we can see them. And sometimes we'll see a large group of broadwings way up north, and it's late in the day, like 6, 7 p.m. So the sun's getting low, and we can see them getting lower in their, in their Sometimes they'll pause and circle, and sometimes, if we're lucky, we have seen it a few times, they'll all come down and they'll all land, hundreds of them. And uh, those are the times we're up there bright and early the next morning for sure, because in the morning they start rising. As soon as the sun comes up, they'll start rising, and they'll start, and they'll just, they'll just circle low till they all get up, and they all say, okay, troops, let's go, and they all go south. One of my favorite moments was one morning, we got up there early, because we knew they came in and they roosted. And the sun was coming up and the sun had just risen off to the east, it's shining onto the mountainside. Um, and the, so the west side of the mountain is facing the sun and we're looking at it and someone noticed a bunch of white dots, just with your naked eye, hundreds of white dots. And I, I, I looked at them with my binoculars, every white dot was a broad wing hawk. And as the sun came up and it was warming the air, they would, they would they would walk out to the end of the branch and face the sun and get warm. And then they would lift off. And then the next one would come out. And they would lift off. It was one of the most memorable moments. I have uh, some pictures of that. It, it looked like Christmas ornaments all over the trees. Yeah. Um, have, have you been able with the, uh, you have a good data set of the weather on an hourly basis. And I don't know what you take on the weather, the temperature, the uh, stuff, but have you been able to make any correlation with that and the, your data set of what you're seeing? Yeah, w over the years we've learned that if the weather forecast shows a strong northwest wind, partly to mostly cloudy, we, we, we're going to have birds, especially in September, October, even November. That's their favorite time to, to migrate. 
they get the best winds. And the stronger the winds, the better. We have been up there on days where, where our chair, if you stand up from your chair, it's blown, it's gone. Or your people on their spotting scopes, their spotting scopes are falling down. It's hard to even stand. And we, we're seeing goshawks and golden eagles flying. And so if we have those west winds, we, we know it's going to be good. If we have, on the other hand, if we have east winds, then you think, oh, boy, let's see. Do I, should I go up there or not? <laughs> but someone's got to be there. Yeah. All right. Please join me in thanking Vic again for a wonderful Thanks. talk. And, I, and I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, take questions if you want to come up afterwards. Also want to remind you that there are several of us in the audience that represent the Museum of Natural History, as well as the Center for Cold Waters Restoration and a number of efforts that are going on locally to try to promote talks like this, interpretation of natural history. Uh, feel free to come up and talk to us. And I remember that there's a table out in the back too still with the Augusta Bird Club folks. So hope you can join us next month. Next month we'll be hearing about salamanders from our curator at the Museum of Natural History.